I woke up to the sound of my alarm. I groaned and stretched before going to have a bath. When I went out to fix myself some breakfast, I saw Greg, my roommate. He was typing on his laptop. I frowned as I moved closer. That looked like my Netflix account. Good morning, Greg. Is that my Netflix account? I asked. I needed to watch a movie, so I borrowed your password, he said, without looking back. I told him that he should ask me before he used my things, and he made a non-committal sound that I interpreted as agreement. I went to the kitchen to make scrambled eggs and stopped in shock. The kitchen was a mess. Greg must have cooked here. Spilled milk was on the counter. Cheerios were all over the sink and dirty plates were placed haphazardly in the sink. I scowled as I put things in order. Greg never returned what he used. He always made a mess of everything and refused to clean it up. I was tired of putting up with him. I cleaned the kitchen before eating. My girlfriend, Josie, was coming over. She usually came over to my place for the weekend. I looked around the house and made everywhere neat. Greg ignored me, laughing at whatever he was watching. The doorbell rang and I hurried to open the door. Josie was smiling at me and I hugged her, inhaling her fresh scent. She laughed and asked if I missed her that much. You have no idea, I replied as I led her inside. I needed a break from everything that had to do with Greg. Greg glanced up as we went to my room, his gaze lingering on Josie. I stiffened and held Josie more firmly, shutting the door with a bang. The next day, Josie and I decided to eat out. Her phone was pinging incessantly. She brought it out and checked it. Josie angrily shoved her phone in my face. I focused on what she was showing me and my mouth dropped open. Greg had been sending her messages, extremely gross messages. He told her he loved her and wanted to be with her. The messages he sent were full of declarations of love and admiration for Josie's body. The last messages were pictures of him I can't even describe. I can't deal with this. Tell him to stop. I've blocked his number already. I can't come over to your place, not with that weirdo there. Josie crossed her arms, looking angrier than I've ever seen her. I rubbed my face. I was furious with Greg. He was hitting on my girlfriend. I knew we were not friends, but I never knew he could do something like this. I calmed Josie down and told her we would stay at her place during the weekends. I didn't want her anywhere near Greg. Josie was visibly angry. Hey, why is the most beautiful girl in this place frowning? I asked, coaxing a smile from her. I exhaled in relief. I didn't want her to be in a bad mood. For the next few weeks, I stayed over with Josie on the weekends. I spoke very little to Greg. I still cleaned up after Greg my patience running out gradually. It was a Saturday and Josie and I bought some drinks. We chatted and drank till we both got drunk. I put Josie to sleep after placing a glass of water and aspirin by her bedside for the hangover she would definitely have the next day. It was very late so I ordered an Uber and went home. I stumbled inside and hit the switch. The light was very bright for my now sensitive eyes that I had to squint. My mouth was bitter. I made my way to the bathroom, holding the wall for support. I picked up my brush and recoiled in disgust. It was stinking. I sniffed it and gagged. It smelled like it had been in someone's butt. I rinsed my mouth and went to my room. I rubbed my eyes. Matter of fact, I wasn't seeing well. My room was a mess. Someone had ransacked my wardrobe. All my clothes were strewn on the floor. There was a yellowish stain on my bed, like vomit. My body started to shake in anger. I stormed to Greg's room, not caring that it was midnight. I threw open his door and yelled his name. He jerked awake, his blue eyes roving around before focusing on me. I have had enough of this! He asked me to lower my voice, and I scoffed. I was beyond reason. I would tell his crimes for the entire world to hear. I went to his wardrobe and poured his clothes out. He ran to me, wondering what was going on. You're leaving today. I can't do this anymore. He looked at me like I had grown an extra head. 
Then he laughed. He told me I had to be joking. When I confronted him about the mess in my room, he merely shrugged and said it was nothing serious. He said he was looking for a nice shirt to wear. And my toothbrush? It smells dreadful. Oh, that. I meant to toss it away when I was done using it. I forgot. My hand fisted and connected with the side of his face. He never saw it coming. His head flew to the side. I stood there smirking, feeling good about myself. My hand was throbbing, but I felt no pain. He tried to punch me, but I dodged it, swaying on my feet. My vision blurred. The drinks were affecting my balance. I shook it off. You have been nothing but a nuisance, I yelled and punched him in the stomach. He doubled over in pain, clutching his stomach. I felt so satisfied to expel all the anger in my system. And this is for my girlfriend! I brought my knee up and smashed his face. He shouted for me to stop. Blood was running down his face. I stood there, panting. He was clearly in pain. He suddenly rushed forward and knocked me to the floor. I hit the back of my head on the floor and saw stars. My drunk state wasn't helping matters. Someone pulled him off me. It was the security man. He shook his head at both of us and informed us that we were disturbing others. He told us he met the door unlocked and headed straight for the source of the noise. He yelled at us some more, saying something about us acting like hormonal teenagers. Greg and I were too busy glaring at each other to listen to him. The security man drove us to the hospital in tense silence. After I got treated, I went home, concluding in my mind that I couldn't live with Greg anymore. I got home before he did and packed my things. I would stay with Josie till I get another apartment, and I would make sure I have no roommate this time. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs>
I think we should move in together, you know, take the next step into our relationship, he said. I agreed. I couldn't believe it. I went from a toxic relationship to this amazing guy who wants to move in together so fast. In my experience, guys avoid commitment, but he was different. He got me in ways that no one ever did. Before we knew it, we were standing in the middle of our new apartment. There we were, happy as can be. We rented it out in a not so good part of town because that's all we could afford. Nevertheless, we didn't care. We were happy. Well, at least that's what I thought. Everything went amazing for the next couple of months. We would do everything together around the house. It was amazing to spend all my time with him and he seemed happy also. But we had a problem. We didn't have a lot of money. I worked from home doing social media marketing and he worked as a mechanic. But clients were not coming over as usual because of the bad economy. One evening, Michael announced that he had lost his job. He would always tell me that he'd look for something else, but I never saw him do it. One day, I came home from the grocery store. He didn't even help me with that giant bag. He just got up from the couch with his eyes still on his phone. As he approached the grocery bag, looking for some chips or something, I saw what he was looking at. Are you looking at OnlyFans? What the hell, Michael? I'm out shopping and you're looking at other girls? Calm down. I'm still living with you, right? What are you bitching about? He told me. I was shocked. He talked to me in that way. I asked for an apology, but he acted like he didn't hear me. Instead, he said this. Why won't you make an OnlyFans, babe? You're pretty hot and you'd make so much money for us, he told me. Are you kidding me? I am the only one who brings money into this house and now you also want me to make an OnlyFans? Why don't you just get a job instead of coming up with these ideas? I told him, almost yelling as I was really angry. He told me to watch how I talked to him and told me to think about that idea. I was so angry that night that I slept on the couch. I couldn't stand to see his face. Over the next couple of days, he kept insisting more and more with his OnlyFans idea. I told him no and he became visibly angry. One day, while telling him that he is stupid for always insisting with this idea, he grabbed me by the hair and threw me on the floor. You will do as I say, you bitch, he told me, but I refused again. So he picked me up and slapped me over the face. I tried to hit him back, but he grabbed my hand. He then slapped me again and said, I've had it with you. He then tied me to a chair and taped my mouth. Then he took the chair in the kitchen and told me the following. You have until morning to think about this OnlyFans idea. I'm sick of you telling me that I am stupid. You will do it or you will die. The choice is yours. He then shut off the lights in the kitchen and went into the bedroom to sleep. I couldn't believe what was going on. It was like I was part of some prank or something. It all seemed surreal, but slowly I realized that this psycho was for real and he was really going to kill me if I don't do it. I had to escape, but I didn't know how to. I was tied up, but then I saw a knife on the counter. I had to get it so that I could cut the rope. He fell asleep fast as I could hear him snore. This was my chance. I moved the chair little by little, but as soon as I was close to the knife, I fell on one side. Luckily, as I fell, I managed to bang my head against the counter. During the impact, the knife fell to the ground, well within my reach. I managed to cut my way out to freedom. The next thing I did was to call the cops and get out of the house, locking him inside with no way of getting out. They soon showed up and upon seeing me in a badly beaten up shape, decided to take immediate action. Thankfully, I have never heard from Michael since then. I'm a 30 year old man now. I wanna believe that I have my life together. I've never let any setback affect me in such a way that I would drift off and go into a direction that wouldn't be beneficial for my life. I've been working in a bank as a teller for over seven years. It wasn't my dream job. I always wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid or even a fireman. 
But as I got older, I started to take on more and more responsibilities and I needed a stable job. This, this situation put me in a position where I found myself at my first job interview. I was struggling with money at the time and wanted to do something with my life. I needed structure. Then a friend of mine told me that they had a position open at the bank he was working at as well. One thing led to another and there I was, sitting face to face with the bank manager. He could tell right away that I had some baggage, but because it was something personal, he decided not to dive deeper into it. He thought I was a perfect fit for the job and that was that. But what baggage am I referring to? Well, something happened when I was a child, something terrible which would stay tattooed in my brain for as long as I see the light of day. Let me go back in time and I'll tell you about it. And as I'm writing my memories, I will try to do it through the eyes of my 12 year old self. I opened my eyes and stared at the ceiling for a couple of seconds. The birds were already chirping outside and the sun was shining, but I was not ready to get out of bed. The buzzing noise was my alarm clock. It was still set at 6.30 AM, the time I was supposed to get up and get ready for school. But I was angry that morning, angrier than I've been in a while. Even angrier than the time Andy slapped my ice cream out of my hand that one time we were right outside his house. Why is this alarm on? I thought my mom took care of it. I told myself my buzzing noise wouldn't stop. Finally, I got up and shut it off. This was unacceptable. It was the first day of summer vacation. I didn't want to be woken up so early. And once I got up, I couldn't sleep anymore but I saw the good part in the situation. I get to play more today, I said to myself. But a thought dawned in my mind. Everyone's asleep at this hour. Jack and Macy, but I'm sure they'll wake up in a couple more hours. This thought took a toll on my enthusiasm. I was up, but none of my friends were. So all I had to do was play some video games and wait until they were ready to go outside. Slowly, I brushed my teeth as I was looking into the mirror at my frizzy hair and then decided to go downstairs for some breakfast. Why are you up so early? My mom said while she surprised me at this hour. The alarm clock went off. You didn't turn it off, I replied to her while frowning. She then smiled and came right at me to give me a hug. I'm sorry, honey. Why don't you go back to bed? She asked me. I told her that I couldn't sleep anymore and that I was hungry. Before she left for work, she asked me what I wanted to eat and of course, I wanted a big bowl of cereal. She poured me one and then kissed me goodbye. My dad already left about 5 a.m. He had a government job or something, so he was supposed to go to work really early. The only one in my house was me and another person, a person which I didn't like very much, my big sister, Rachel. She was already 17 and she would bully me each time she'd see me. Luckily, she was asleep and wouldn't be up until around noon. I had the entire house to myself, which was nice. So for the next couple of hours, I played video games and the day went by just like that. I went out around 2 p.m. with my friends playing around the house. My mom and dad got home and Rachel didn't even bully me that day, but finally it was dinner time. We were all around the table. So mom, tomorrow I'm going on that trip with my friends, Rachel told mom. She was supposed to leave in the morning and come back at night. Yeah, I know, mom said while having a worried look on her face. She then looked at my dad, who showed the same expression. As I later found out, they were leaving on some business trips and wouldn't be home all day tomorrow, so someone needed to look after me. I told you, I don't want a babysitter. I'm 12. I'm old enough to spend the day alone, I told my parents, but they didn't want to hear anything of it. So after some phone calls and some yelling on my part, they found a babysitter in the paper. The next day, she came early, before my parents left. She seemed nice. She was a little bit older than my sister and she smiled a lot. I kind of liked her. So there we were, me and my babysitter called Mary. I went about my business playing video games and she stayed on the couch reading a book. What's that book about? I asked her, seeing that she was really into it. After a pause, she turned her head and said, you wouldn't get it, and then <laughs> laughed a little before returning to her book. I thought it was pretty weird. I caught a glimpse of the cover and saw that it was a guy with a mask on his mouth. It was pretty creepy and the mask had a little opening where his mouth was with little bars. Anyway, I returned to my video game. After some time, I see her going into the bedroom. I didn't think any more about it, but I heard some noise coming out of there after a while. I paused my game and went towards the door. I didn't open it because that would have been rude. Are you okay in there? 
I asked while staying close to the door. It took a couple of seconds for her to respond, but finally I heard, Come in. I want to show you something, she told me. I don't think I should, I told her from outside the bathroom. But even before I could finish my sentence, the door opened and she grabbed me by the hand and pulled me inside. My eyes started watering immediately. There were so many fumes in there, but she didn't seem bothered by it. While still holding my hand, she pushed me towards the bathtub. I could see that it was filled with something. It was bubbling, and for that reason, there were so many fumes in there. What are you, what are you doing? Let me go! I yelled and tried to free myself, but she was too strong. Come on, I want to do an experiment, she said while laughing and putting my hand in the bathtub. Fortunately for me, I managed to twist somehow at the last moment, and only my elbow touched the stuff that was in the bathtub. I immediately felt it burn my skin and I screamed. I kicked her in the knee and she let go for a second. It wasn't enough for me to come out of the bathroom and into the living room. She started chasing me, but as soon as she got out of the bathroom, she froze. What's going on here? My dad asked. He came home early from work, and thank God he did. Later, I found out that the bathtub was filled with some sort of acid. She had it in little bags and put them in water, and that's why it burned my skin on contact. I don't know what happened to her after that, as my dad sent me to my room as he was calling the police. But I was lucky he got home in time. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> I walked into my apartment after a long day at work. I was pretty excited to go for tonight's get-together with my close friends. It was a perfect opportunity to unwind from the whole week's stress. I sat on my couch and opened my email app to see that I had multiple notifications from my OnlyFans account. The women loved me, I laughed. Logging into my account, I saw that the video I posted last night had a lot of engagement. My OnlyFans was loved by both male and female subscribers. I checked the messages and saw so many women fawning all over me. There was a message that said, love your six packs, while one other said, we're looking for you, sweetheart. I scrolled back up and went through my pictures. I had a chiseled torso with rock hard abs, strong muscles, and tattoos on my shoulder and stomach. I watched myself move to sexual healing by Marvin Gaye playing in the background. No wonder people loved me. I looked really good. I stood up and walked to my bedroom, wondering what I should do next for my subscribers. I shrugged as I walked into the room. An idea would come later. As I drove to a nearby bar to meet my friends, the thought of going full-time on OnlyFans crossed my mind. Why not? I said to myself. After all, I was becoming popular day by day. Hey Kane, I'm glad you could make it, George said while giving me a high five. I'm glad I could make it too, I smiled. Where is Sam? Holding to our regular place, George said. Hey bro, Sam called out to me as we reached the table. We all began to catch up with all we've missed. As the night went on, we kept doing our own thing. Looking around, I noticed two ladies staring at me intently and I quickly moved my eyes away from them. Unable to shake off the feeling of being watched, I looked towards them again and saw them still staring at me intently while whispering. One of them finally noticed I was looking and smiled. I smiled back awkwardly and looked away. That was creepy. I resumed my conversation with Sam and George. I made sure not to get too drunk. I checked the time and saw that it was pretty late. I bid farewell to the guys and stood up to head out. I looked behind me to see the girls heading out too. Ignoring it, I got to my car and drove away. As I was about to drive into my garage, a car drove past me and I saw one of the girls driving the car. I was right. Something was fishy. Those girls were stalking me. I had no idea why. Waking up to the sound of my alarm, I yawned, tired after last night's party. Another day at that terrible 9-to-5 workplace, I sighed. I didn't really like my job, but it paid the bills, so I had to put up with it. I tried to cheer myself up and walked into the bathroom to start my monotonous day. I walked into the office and said hi to Bailey as I walked past her cubicle. She was the secretary, but before I could leave, she called me back. Kane, you have visitors, she said. What visitors? I asked, confused. Two women came this morning asking for you. I told them to wait in the cafeteria. I headed towards the cafeteria. 
My face paled as I recognized one of them as the women who were stalking me. They smiled and waved at me. I really didn't know what to do. I simply wanted to run away from there. However, I sensed that it was my office place and things could escalate if I don't handle this situation maturely. The women told me that they simply loved me and wanted a private get-together with me. I told them that I was not interested and they could place their requests on my OnlyFans. No one says no to us, sweetheart. You will do as we say, said one of them, smilingly. Ex excuse me? Do you want a scene here? Isn't this the place you work at? Said the other girl. Scared, I agreed to their demand. They told me to get ready in the evening and would drop a message with the location. Do bring your A-game, champ! I returned home from work and sank into my couch. Those women knew where I lived, where I worked. If I don't go today, God knows what they will do, I thought. As I entered the hotel room, I saw that the girls were holding glasses of wine and were laughing. I was visibly nervous. Before I proceeded with the show, I asked them why they were doing all this. They laughed and told me that this was nothing new for them, but I was probably the most ripped they had until now. I then asked them whether they would stop bothering me after that night. To this, the girls let out a loud, sadistic laugh. They were totally having a good time. I excused myself to the washroom on the pretense of freshening up for the show. In reality, I was simply buying myself some time. As I waited inside, I could hear commotion outside. I opened the door just wide enough to let myself take a peek and heaved a sigh of relief. There they were, standing at the main door, two cops and my friend George. The girls were left completely shocked. They tried to portray themselves as innocent, but I had the complete recording on my phone. Earlier that evening, I had called up George and narrated him everything. He then told me to calm down and make conversation in the hotel room while keeping the phone recorder on. He told me not to worry and he would take care of the rest. The next day, George and I submitted the recording to the cops. Thankfully, I have never seen or heard from that troublemaker duo since then. It was always one thing or the other with being a driver in this busy city. One could either have a very bad customer who would end up ruining the day or car issues that were not even foreseen. But on better days, some customers just end up making one happy. One of those customers would be Layla. The very first day I met her, she was charming, attractive, with a good sense of humor. Everything about her had the perfect or almost perfect mark on them. Consequently, like it was fate, I became her driver twice in a week. It was the highlight of my week. Just seeing her walk into the car gave me sparks that I didn't even know existed inside of me. Hi, Layla, I greeted as soon as she got into the car. It's been about a month since I met her, and figuring out about a week ago that I probably developed feelings for her made it difficult to contain myself each time our eyes met. Hey, Harris. How are you this morning? I missed you. Her sweet, candy-like voice was one of the perks to knowing a Layla, knowing this Layla. I summoned all courage to tell her how I was feeling. I secretly hoped she would say yes. It would be a lot easier and less awkward for both of us. As I drive, I watched her smile at me from the mirror. Oh, that smile. Everything about her was heavenly. Layla? Yeah? I hope this does not get weird, but I'll go straight to the point. I think I'm in love with you. I just can't imagine not seeing you in one week. Look at it. This is fate bringing us together. Why did it take you so long to ask this? I've been waiting since forever. Her reply was not what I was expecting, but it was the best kind of reply I hoped for. Would you be my girlfriend? Yeah, duh. I would not want it any other way. It was done. I had a pretty and sweet girlfriend. Weeks passed and things were going on smoothly. Layla was as sweet as ever and driving different customers with different attitudes was becoming easier because I had something I could look forward to by the end of the day, Layla. I was deeply in love with her. She knew this and I hoped she felt the same way. My phone beeped, signaling that I had a request to go pick up someone, but it was going to be my girlfriend first. 
Layla had been borrowing my car for days now. She refused to tell me why. So how do I assume it was something personal? I trusted her enough with my car, although I couldn't help but think about what she needed the car for, four times a week. It was becoming harder to not get suspicious. If she was involved in anything shady with my car, the police would arrest me because I was the owner of the car. I drove to her apartment, hoping to find out what she really did with the car. I parked, calling her out through the phone. She looked as beautiful as ever. Hey baby, she greeted as she approached me with her mouth pouted, leaning in for a kiss. Hey my love, the car is ready, you told me you were in a rush. I handed the keys to her and she hopped in and drove off. Immediately as she drove off, I called in the Uber that I ordered to follow her. If she didn't want me to know what it was she did with my car, I'd figure it out myself. Many turns and bumps before she parked under a tree. I saw her walk towards a figure. The figure had been under the tree before she arrived in that location. As the figure came into light, I saw a man about my age. He had this fierce look on his way which immediately turned into a smile when he sighted Layla. As she got closer to him, there was a tension that built in me. What could she want from such a guy? My question didn't need to stand for so long before it got answered. I saw them kissing, and it was obvious that I had been stupid all along. She had just been using me for my car because of another guy. I watched as Layla walked into a small building while the guy drove off in my car. My car, now a shared commodity. As my driver drove back, I thought of several things to do. My business was going down because of my car, which I can't possibly use frequently because of a lying girlfriend. Should I confront her? There was no way I misunderstood the situation. My heart was still breaking to see her in another guy's arms. I trusted Layla. How could she hurt me so bad? I wanted to be sure of what I saw and didn't mention anything to Layla. Instead, I followed her three different times and it was the same thing. She met the same guy, kissed him before exchanging my own car between the two of them. As I realized that I was slowly losing the job and that was the only way I could provide for myself, I decided to act on the fact that my loyalty and trust were taken for granted. I had already decided what needed to be done. Whatever we had was about to go down the drain and I didn't care anymore. It was what she deserved. If I remembered correctly, it was a Friday. I met Layla for a cup of coffee together and she looked different to me. Now that I knew what she had been up to, she was not the angel that I thought she was. I smiled at her and she smiled back at me. Just as she finished her coffee, I handed her the keys. The usual lending of the car to Layla happened that day, but not with the usual heart that used to give it willingly. I hugged her before she went off. I didn't mean for a kiss. I had no desire to kiss a liar. She didn't complain about the kiss. She probably barely noticed. It was obvious that it was already over between us before it would become finally over. You will be soon famous, babe, I thought in my mind waved at her as she drove off. Hello? The voice said as the person picked up the phone. Hi, I would like to report the case of a stolen car. Don't worry, share your car details and we will help you, said the cop. The next day, as I was having my morning cup of coffee, I switched on the TV and there she was. Layla and her boyfriend had been caught with drugs in my car. Layla's toxicology test suggested drugs in her blood. They both have been put behind bars. I drank my coffee and smiled. The plan to spike Layla's coffee had worked like a charm. The police did question me later and asked of my relationship with Layla. However, there wasn't much meat in the charges pressed by Layla against me. Needless to say, the whole incident has turned me into a cynical person. But the good part is that I will be very careful the next time I fall for someone. Too scared to subscribe? <laughs> I covered my mouth with my hand to stifle any sound. My foster father, John, rummaged around the house, most likely drunk as usual. I lived with him and his wife, Elizabeth, along with two other foster children. Living with John and Elizabeth was a nightmare. John was a drunkard, and he was always in a bad mood. He would shout at his wife, and sometimes I could swear I heard sounds of him hitting her. Elizabeth was never usually around, 
She wore cheap makeup and, and was always on the lookout for one beauty product or the other. She spent a lot of money trying to buy the latest clothes or bags. I was the oldest of the three children. I would soon be 18 and finally be able to quit this horrible life. I shared a room with Tim and Grace, who were 10 and 8 respectively. I loved them and I took up their role of big sister pretty seriously. They were the only reason living in this family wasn't a total disaster. Now I warned them with wide eyes to not make a sound as John continued to crash into different things in the living room. I heard him curse a few times as he hit something. We all knew how cranky he could be when he got drunk. Grace whimpered and snuggled into me. I put my hand over her mouth, quietly telling her to hush. Tim stared at us from his bed, fear evident in his eyes. I did my best to not look so scared. I gave Tim a reassuring smile that I didn't feel. Finally, John's steps faded as he entered the bedroom. We heaved a sigh of relief. Jane, I'm scared, Grace said, tears falling from her eyes. I wiped them gently. I'm here. There's nothing to be scared of. I promise that I'll protect you both, I said as I glanced at Tim. I hummed under my breath and soon enough, they fell asleep. I sighed, dejected. I hoped I didn't have to give a promise I couldn't keep. According to the social workers, John and Elizabeth were perfect for foster parents. They contributed to society and had stable jobs. John worked in a bank and Elizabeth worked in a publishing house. They had taken one look at their income and pronounced them fit to take care of three foster kids. We were unfortunate to be picked. Social services didn't see that John was a drunkard who was prone to get violent. They didn't see that Elizabeth was inexperienced as a mother and all she wanted to do was be caught up with anything new in the world of fashion. We knew that some children had it worse. Some had been with foster parents that would abuse them physically. That's why we didn't report John and Elizabeth. What if we ended up in a worse family? I was helping Grace and Tim with their homework when I heard the front door open. It was John and he sounded angry. I warned my foster siblings to stay put in their room and went out to the living room. I saw John and Elizabeth arguing. Suddenly, John slapped her hard and she screamed as she fell to the floor, holding her face. I winced, unable to move from where I was. Elizabeth looked at him with hate in her eyes. She got up from the floor in a flash and raked her fingers across his face, screaming like a banshee. John staggered back and put his hands to his face. They came back wet with blood. You wanna kill me, woman? Is that your plan? He yelled at her, livid. This was the first time I was seeing them get violent physically. They usually argued in front of us, but it never got physical. John took two steps toward Elizabeth and she ran backwards, trying to avoid him. I tried to move away from her path, but I was too slow and she hit me, bowling me over. I fell down, hitting my side on the edge of the table. I yelled in pain, clutching my side. It was bleeding. John continued to advance towards us. Elizabeth was on the floor beside me and she clambered to get up. I've had enough with your insolence. John snatched Elizabeth by her hair and banged her head to the floor. She screamed and I winced. I crawled away from them and peeked at the entrance to our room. I had instructed Tim and Grace to not come out for anything. So I was shocked to see their scared faces at the door. A vase toppled over and it shattered as it hit the floor. I watched, transfixed as Elizabeth struggled to keep one of the shards. John was above her, slapping and punching her. Her hand closed around a big one, and she drove her arm upwards with a grunt. The glass got embedded in John's left side, and he stilled. After a few seconds, he yelled as the pain hit him. He pulled out the glass, and blood started to gush out, wetting him and Elizabeth still under him. He was too weak to do anything, as Elizabeth pushed him off of her and kicked him in his back. He fell to the floor, bleeding out, and Elizabeth sat on the floor, hugging her knees and rocking back and forth. The pain in my side reminded me that I was still bleeding, and I applied pressure to the wound. I walked gingerly to the phone and called the police. I explained to them that there was a case of domestic violence that needed urgent attention. After giving our address, they promised to arrive soon. John's breathing was getting shallow, and Elizabeth just stared off into space with vacant eyes. Tim and Grace came out and saw that I was bleeding. Grace started to cry, and I couldn't get her to stop. Tim just stood, not knowing what to do. The police arrived and took our statements. An ambulance was called and I got bandaged up. 
John was still alive, so he was rushed to the hospital for further care. After he got better, he was charged with assault. Elizabeth was let off with a warning after the judge concluded that it was in self-defense that she stabbed John. He recommended sessions with a therapist and declared her unfit to look after anyone else. Tim, Grace, and I were taken back to the facility. Tim and Grace found a family before me, and I made sure I stalked them enough before concluding that they were good people. A few months before my 18th birthday, a newly wedded middle-aged couple took an interest in me. They filed all the necessary forms and I moved in with them. They were nice people and living with them was so pleasant. I visited Tim and Grace from time to time to see for myself that they were doing okay. I was glad to see that the shadows under their eyes were gone. It might take a while for any of us to be fully fine, but I knew we would get there. We all tend to be nice. I mean, I certainly said something along the lines of, if you need anything at all, call me, or something like that. It's something that we all say when the situation calls for it. But 99% of the time, we really don't mean it. Let me tell you about what happened to me about two years ago when I tried to be nice to someone. And I don't want to advise you guys that you shouldn't help out here or there. But, well, just be careful. Anyway, it was a Sunday afternoon. Since I own my own company, I usually work during the weekends also. It's a hard grind, but by doing so, I managed to make my business grow significantly, and that, in return, made me live a life that not many people could afford. I don't want to brag and say that I'm rich, but I do pretty well for myself. Moving on with the story. As I was saying, it was a Sunday afternoon. I just finished a project that I've been doing for a client, and I needed some time to relax. That day specifically, I felt the need to take a walk in Central Park, but I lived pretty far off. So instead of taking out my own car, I thought of calling an Uber. The app showed that the car will be arriving in a couple of minutes, so I grabbed my shoes, my phone, and my wallet, and went in front of my building. The street was busy, even though it was a Sunday. Everyone was rushing all over the place in typical New York City fashion. Finally, my Uber arrived and I hopped to the back. To my surprise, my driver for the day was a woman, about 40 years old. She had beautiful hair and a warm smile. We started to talk and she said that she recently started doing this. She was born in another city but moved to the Big Apple so that she could make a name for herself. She always wanted to be in show business, but you know how life goes. It has other plans for you. Since there was traffic that day, we had a chance to talk for some time more than the typical chit-chat I make with other drivers. Her name was Cindy. She told me she was a single woman of two little girls. One was 10 years old and the other one was 12. They loved to read and to draw, and she told me that they were really talented. Cindy also showed me some pictures of them. I didn't think they looked like her at all, and I pointed out that they must resemble her husband. When I said that, she went quiet for a couple of seconds. I got worried since the long pause was making things uncomfortable. I'm, I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? I asked her with a worried look on my face. No, don't worry. I'm sorry, but I get a little emotional when someone brings up this subject, she told me. I apologized again. Cindy told me her husband had died in a terrible car accident right after her second daughter was born. He used to be a fireman and they were deeply in love. We were the perfect family, just like the ones you would see in the movies. But since he passed, Cindy told me while holding in her tears. Cindy continued saying that since her husband passed away, she's been struggling to keep her girls in school and buy them everything that they would ever need. It was such a sad story. I also found out that she worked a couple more jobs. She was a waitress at a diner and also worked as a part-time phone operator for some company. The woman had a very hard time making sure that her girls would have everything they would need. Soon after she told me everything, we arrived at my destination. Because of everything that went on during our ride, I decided to help her out a bit more, and besides the money I owed her, I gave Cindy an extra $300. When she saw the money, she couldn't believe it. I'm so embarrassed. I don't want you to think that I told you everything just to get more money out of you, she told me while looking into my eyes. I don't think that for one second. I know what it's like to struggle. I started from nothing, and I get it. Think of it as a little gift from me. 
I told Cindy while smiling at her and handing her the money. She eventually took it, and she almost started to cry. I also gave her my business card in case she needed some help. I would be just one phone call away, and that was that. I hopped off the car and went into the park while she drove away. Fast forward, and a few weeks passed from that experience, and I forgot all about it. One evening, I was relaxing at home after a full day of working. I was sitting on my couch watching some reruns on TV when suddenly my phone buzzed. It was a message, but I didn't know the number. Upon opening it, I found it a little odd. You think you're better than me? The text said. I was confused for a moment. I didn't know what it actually meant and who was it from. I texted back. I think you got the wrong number. Then I set my phone on the couch next to me. A few moments passed and I got another message. Yeah? You don't even know who I am? Up in your high chair? Not thinking about us poor people? You should be ashamed of yourself, the text said. Now I was even more confused, so instead of texting back, I decided to call the number. Hello? I said. It's your fault. How could I live like this when I can't even support my kids? And you think your $300 would make a difference? I'm in my apartment with a noose around my neck. That's it. I'm done, the voice said. I stopped for a moment to process all that information and then I figured it out. Cindy? I asked. She said that she's surprised that I remembered her. I told her to don't do anything stupid and that I'll be right over. Give me your address and I'll come over right now. Things aren't that bad. Where do you live? I asked her. She gave me an address and I got there in 20 minutes but it felt like an hour. I kept thinking of this woman with two kids about to commit suicide. I got there and went straight into the apartment and without even knocking on the door. As I entered, I kept calling her name. Cindy! Cindy! A voice came from the kitchen. The apartment was dark and only a few candles in the kitchen were lighting up the space. What's going on? I asked. Dinner's ready, Cindy told me with a smile on her face. She wasn't in danger at all. She was all dressed up. I turned on the lights and even the apartment wasn't all that bad. What are you doing? I asked her. I made dinner. Come and sit down, she told me. I asked where her daughters were and she started laughing. Cindy told me that she didn't have any daughters. Where did you get this idea? I'm single and I know that you are too, she said while pouring a glass of wine. Where are you going with this, Cindy? I asked. I have researched everything about you. You are rich but alone and I am the best girl for you. I mean, what's the use of all that money if you don't have anyone to splurge it on? The entire situation seemed creepy to me. Wow, she is nuts, I thought in my head. So I made an excuse and headed out the door and blocked her number. For the next few weeks, she called and texted me from different numbers. With no sign of her stopping the madness, I had to eventually change my number. Imagine the pain of updating all my friends, family, and clients to my new number. There are a lot of crazy people in the world, and you gotta be careful. There is no other option. Too scared to subscribe? (laughs) I sighed with frustration as I entered my apartment. It was hard to believe that I got underpaid for the modeling job I did. That was what was likely to happen because according to them, I'm an upcoming model. Modeling was my passion since I was a little girl. Luckily, I grew up to be tall enough to have a career as a model. It had been hard to pay my bills and I thought the money I got for the job would be a bit more significant. My internet subscription expired two days ago and I couldn't afford to renew it. My friend, Jessica, had been the one paying for my meals these past few days. I couldn't ask her for any more favors. An idea lit up in my head and I got up from my couch. I knocked on one of the apartments across the hall. It was occupied by two guys. They seemed nice enough, always greeting me pleasantly. I was really desperate and the kind of life I live made me unashamed about asking for help. The door opened and one of them came out, the dark-haired one. He was named Tom. Hey, Tom, I need to ask for a favor, I said, my hands together in a pleading gesture. I hoped he granted me my requests. It would save me money. Sure, if I can do it, I will. Come in, Lily, he said with a smile. The living room was beautifully decorated. Paintings hung on the wall, giving the space a cool atmosphere. Tom asked me to sit down and asked him what I wanted. I took a deep breath and asked if they could let me use their Wi-Fi. I explained my situation to him and he listened with his head cocked to one side. Just when I was waiting for his answer with a bated breath, the other guy, Francis, came out from one of the rooms. 
He paused when he saw me on the couch. Lily, so nice to see you. Do you need anything? Francis asked. I glanced at Tom and he told Francis the reason I came. Tom was just about to tell me that I could have access to it and that he was happy to help out. Francis nodded in agreement, telling me that it would be their pleasure. I got the details of the Wi-Fi. The name was Peanut Butter. I raised my eyebrows in question and they replied that the peanut butter was their favorite spread. I laughed and thanked them profusely before heading back to my apartment. For the next two weeks, I went out to try and search for a gig. Most times, I was unsuccessful. Once in a while though, I got some calls. The pay at the end of the day was barely able to feed me. I continued to use the Wi-Fi Tom and Francis gave me access to. The name, Peanut Butter, still made me smile in amusement whenever I used it. I could cross internet subscription off my list now. I applauded myself. I was a struggling model, but still, I was living okay. I frowned thinking, but I got called for a modeling opportunity. If I went out with Alice, I could ask her to cover my transportation to the gig. I couldn't ask Jessica since she was still paying for my meals. I nodded in satisfaction. My plan was good. So I called Alice to ask her to wait for me so we could go together. I got home late, exhausted after many hours of standing, posing, and being blinded by the camera lights. I showered and went to brush my teeth, getting ready for bed. The sound of my door being kicked open startled me. I quickly rinsed my toothbrush and rushed out scared. Police, put up your hands. Three police officers were in my living room, guns drawn. Their faces were serious and they looked at me with hard gazes. I complied, too shocked to do anything else. Was I being arrested? I racked my brain, but I was sure I had done nothing that warranted arrest. So what was going on? I was still frozen when one of them came close and handcuffed me. I shook myself and asked them why I was being arrested. I added that they probably had the wrong person. I had never done anything illegal in my life. The police officer that handcuffed me said that I was under arrest for engaging in illegal online activities. My laptop was confiscated and I was taken to the station for questioning. So many thoughts were running through my head. Did someone frame me? Was there a mix up somewhere? I spent that night alone in a cell. I had never been arrested, so it was a new experience for me. It was an experience I did not want to have again. After my laptop was thoroughly checked and nothing illegal was found, they released me the next day. I kept wondering why I got suspected in the first place. As I got to my apartment, I noticed that the door to Tom and Francis' apartment was left open. I shrugged and entered my place, not thinking much about it. The next day, there was a knock on my door. It was the police officer that had questioned me. He told me that the illegal activities were carried out from Tom and Francis's laptops, and he was sorry for the stress I went through. I nodded in confusion. It never occurred to me that my neighbors could be criminals. I thought they were nice. The police were able to seize their laptops eventually, but both the guys were nowhere to be found. Their wardrobes were still intact. Only their personal things were missing. They probably ran away the same night the police came to arrest me. It was discovered that they visited the dark web regularly and even paid to watch illegal things there. When I started using their Wi-Fi, it was the same network that was logged into the dark web. The police traced the address and it led to me. That's why I was arrested, even though I was innocent. Over the phone, I narrated my ordeal to Jessica. I told her about my experience with the police and spending a night in jail. I explained to her about my neighbors and how they were practicing illegal activities. Lily, this freeloading life of yours almost got you in trouble. As your friend, I advise you you stop making others take up your responsibilities, at least not strangers. I know things are difficult for you now, but if you replan how you live your life, you'll see that it will get better, Jessica said. I sighed. I understood what Jessica was saying and I promised her that I would act on it. The episode I had with the police was one I hope to never repeat in my life. I'm not actually a person who loves to tell private things about my past, but, well, I need to get something off my chest. I am 32 now, and I like to think I'm pretty well off. I have a great job at a big electronics company, and recently I've been promoted to the position of teen lead. I have a wonderful wife whom I love very much and we are expecting our first child. She's only two months pregnant but I already painted and furnished the baby room. 
We are so excited. And I just want to say that my life is perfect at the time. But it wasn't always like this. I was born in a bad part of town. I won't tell you where, but it was known for its level of poverty. I mean, all I ever heard while I was growing up were gunshots, screaming, windows being broke, and things of that caliber. Me and my parents didn't really have anything in common. I mean, I was home alone almost all of the time. Even when I was a baby, my parents would go out, do their business, and I guess I was just lucky I survived. I didn't even have a baby crib. They would leave me on the bed, and we all know how dangerous that is for a baby. My mom did drugs. I'm not proud of it, but I'm trying to be as honest as I can in this story. And she did the hard stuff. I won't say what it is, but you get the idea. Her teeth were falling out. Her hair was thinning, and she barely ate. My dad, well, he was in the same boat, but he was also selling drugs. And the little money he would have after spending almost all of it on alcohol and God knows what, he would buy me my baby food. One day, when I was about eight, me and my mom were walking home. We went to the clinic that day to get me checked out. And because we didn't have any money for a bus, we had to walk a lot of blocks. Come on, move it. I got stuff to do, you know. My mom would tell me. I was a little kid. I think she expected me to run. Anyway, we continued walking, and it was obvious that she was getting angrier and angrier. When we were right outside a park where kids would play, I ran towards the fence and I started to look at the other kids. They were looking like they had so much fun. Some were playing soccer. Others were skipping rope. But I never knew what that felt like. I never played with any kids. I was homeschooled. That's what my mom would say. But I never learned anything. Because I did that, my mom came right up to me and smacked me across the face. She did it so hard that the noise it made reached across the park and the other parents saw what just happened. Then, without realizing that people were looking at us, she started hitting me again and again. I started crying and some of the parents came over. They had a talk with my mom and then they called the police. After some investigation, they were classified as unfit parents and I ended up in foster care. All of a sudden, my life changed. I wasn't at home anymore. I was in a building with strange people and lots of kids. I had no idea what was going on. A lady came up to me and told me that this would be my new home. You were bad. That's why your parents were acting the way they did. You deserve a hell of a lot worse, but I don't break the rules, unfortunately, the woman told me. I had no idea what she said and what she meant. I was deafened by the sound of screaming children, punching each other, crying and throwing stuff around. Thank God I wasn't there for long. Soon, I was called to the office, and there I saw two people who seemed pretty nice. Hello? I said, while looking at the ground. Don't be shy. Come closer and have a seat. Come meet your new foster parents, the man in charge said. I did just that and took a seat next to those people. After some paperwork, I ended up going home with them. The man, named Mark, was an electronics engineer. He would often work with some kind of chips, then program them with the help of his computer and show me cool stuff. He also gave me a miniature action figure of Captain America, which he had designed especially for me. I always kept it close to me. The woman was a homemaker and would cook amazing pot roast. They seemed to be respectable people who treated me nicely. They even enrolled me in school. I had no idea what a school was and I started from a lower grade. I was the oldest one in my class, but it was okay. It seemed like that life was slowly but surely turning around. Knowing that I was safe and taken care of, everything started being fun. One day, as I was walking back home from school, I saw a white-colored van slow down as it crossed me. I didn't give it much of a thought and kept walking. A couple of minutes went by, and suddenly, someone pressed their hand across my mouth. And then, 
It was all darkness. I tried to scream as I was pulled into the van. Someone punched me so hard that I passed out. As I opened my eyes, I saw that I was in some sort of dimly lit warehouse. There were two people in front of me. Both of them were masked. From what I could make out, one of them was a woman. They were discussing something amongst themselves. Please, let me go. I'm just a kid. I pleaded. The woman angrily rushed towards me, probably wanting to hit me. The man held her hand and stopped her. They then brought out their phone and started recording my video. I kept on crying and shouting for me to be freed. They then switched off the lights and left the room. There I was, a 10-year-old kid, all alone in a pitch-dark room. I kept banging on the door, but it seemed like no one could hear me. I was so, so scared and passed out soon. I was woken up by the noise of police sirens. As the door of the room opened, I saw Betty. She had tears all over her face as she hugged me. What I saw next shocked me to the core. The police had handcuffed the people who abducted me. They were my real mom and dad. Apparently, they had done all this to extort money from my new parents. Later that night, at the dinner table, I thanked Mark and Betty for saving my life, but I was visibly confused. Betty asked me what was bothering me. How did the police track me so quickly? On hearing this, Mark smiled and pointed towards my Captain America figure. Mark told me that before handing over the figure to me, he had placed one of his microchips inside of it. It had some sort of live tracker which was directly linked to Mark's laptop. I didn't understand much of it at that time, but since then, I always dreamt of becoming an electronics engineer like Mark. Let me tell you about a time I used to work at a convenience store. I had seen a lot of things going down there, especially at night. All types of weird people came into the store. One time, an old lady came in. She seemed harmless enough. She said hello when she came through the door, which seemed like a wonderful thing to me. I mean, no one even bothers to acknowledge the person at the cash register, sometimes not even when they want to pay something. So the old lady comes in, and because she seemed so nice, I didn't think anything about it. After almost 20 minutes of looking through the aisles, she came to the counter with a can of peas. I scanned the product, and she was on her way. But before she went out of the store, a chocolate bar, an expensive bottle of wine, and several bags of candy fell from inside her big coat. Another time, two little boys came in. They seemed like they were twins, although not identical. They were about 12 or 13 years old. As I was minding my business at the cash register, I heard a commotion, so I went to see what was going on. As I arrived at the scene, Cereal and juice were spilled on the floor, and the boys were laughing and laughing with their phones out. It seemed like they were filming a TikTok or something. But I'm not here to tell you about all these harmless things that happened at the store. I have one story that stands out, and it does by a mile. It's about one particular guy. I'll never forget his face. It was a boring Wednesday afternoon. Nothing special about that day. Well, Actually, nothing special happened all week, and I was grateful for that. I like things to be in a certain way. A guy walked in. He was about six feet tall, but very skinny. It seemed like he didn't eat a lot at all. Of course, like all the other customers do, he ignored me while I was sitting at the counter and he walked past me, going straight to the frozen food section from what I could see. He grabbed a couple of frozen whole chickens and puts them in his shopping cart. Then, he headed over to the produce section and picked up some tomatoes and potatoes. Nothing out of the ordinary there. After he was done with the vegetables, it seemed like he was heading towards the counter. But I was wrong. He just stopped in his tracks and turned the other way. I couldn't see where he was going, but I had a feeling that something was wrong. Not long after that, I heard a loud noise. I rushed towards the place where the noise came from and I almost saw all of my peanut butter jars on the floor. 
The man was just standing there with his head pointed towards the floor, looking at those jars. What happened, sir? Are, are you okay? I asked him politely. Yeah, peanut butter. That's all he said to me, while still staring at those jars that were rolling by his feet. Did you do this, sir? I asked him after he said he was okay. It's not my fault, he responded before lifting his head and looking at me. Then, without saying another word, he started walking past me, heading towards the counter and putting his chicken and vegetables on it. Oh, I'll just deal with this later. I told myself and I headed towards him so I can scan his groceries. I did just that and after, with a smile on my face, I looked at the guy and said, Have a good day, sir. But he didn't even look at me. He grabbed his bag and rushed outside the store without even a goodbye. I thought it was rude, but you know, it wasn't the first time that happened and certainly it wouldn't be the last. I decided not to think any more about it and I rearranged the peanut butter before returning to the counter. This was my first encounter with that guy. An entire week passed and I didn't see him. Not until next Wednesday. Hello, sir. How was the chicken? I greeted him. Again, he didn't acknowledge me. He just headed towards the products. I sighed and tried not to let it bother me. But to be honest, I was getting kind of sick of people not saying hello to me. Another person came in, and to my surprise, she said hello, and even asked how my day was going. Finally, I'm doing very well. How about you? I responded with a big smile on my face. I'm great. Just came in for a little bit of shopping. The lady responded while she chuckled. About 10 minutes went by, and a loud noise startled me. It sounded exactly as it did the last time that guy was in the store. I went over to check it out, and the peanut butter was on the floor again. Sir, did you do this? I asked him. At that point, it was obvious that he was doing it on purpose. It's not my fault! He screamed at me, and at that moment, I really lost it. I said that I would go and check the security cameras if he doesn't come clean. The guy started yelling again, telling me the exact same thing, that it's not his fault. Sir, please leave the store. I'm sorry, but you have to go, I told him. He got even angrier and then shouted again at me. It's not my fault. It's the peanut butter. It's the peanut butter's fault. I was left speechless. What did he mean? The peanut butter's fault? While we were going back and forth, the lady that came in earlier approached us. We stopped shouting for a moment as she was right at the peanut butter shelf. She picked up one of the jars. The guy switched his attention towards the lady, looking her in the eyes. What are you doing? He asked, while almost shouting. I'm buying it for my son. He's 10, and it's good for his health. I myself have always been a fan of it since I was a little girl. The lady said right before she laughed. It seemed like she relieved the tension, but I was wrong. The guy flipped out and using a ketchup bottle, he first hit the lady's hand, knocking the peanut butter jar out of her hand. Before the lady could react, he smashed the bottle on her neck. The lady starts bleeding all over the floor and the guy had a look in his eyes that seemed like he was about to commit murder. He was looking me in the eyes and he took a step towards me. I turned around and ran outside as fast as I could. After I had run a safe distance, I called the cops. They quickly arrived and they were just around the corner and took the guy to jail. I later learned something about him. Apparently, his mother was deranged and fed him peanut butter for the first 10 years of his life, in breakfast, lunch, and dinner, never missing a day. The guy ran away from his home when he was 11 and has hated peanut butter since then. While I felt bad for the poor guy, his reaction towards the lady was still uncalled for. Roommates. Almost all of us have had them at some point in our lives. They could be a blessing or in some cases, they could be a true nuisance. Let me tell you about a time in my life when me and my girlfriend Alice were at the start of our careers. We just finished college a couple of years back and managed to get some entry-level jobs with startups that created social media apps. 
I'm not going to mention their names because they're not important to the thing that happened to us. As I was saying, we were young, and the jobs we had didn't pay nearly as much for us to afford our own place, but we managed to find a wonderful apartment online. We fell in love with it, but it came with a catch. It was slightly above our budget. Hence, we could not have the entire place to ourselves. The owner seemed pretty cool with us moving in to occupy one room. In fact, he had already found another tenant to occupy the other one. Before we moved in, we met the guy who already paid rent there. His name was Will. He seemed a little odd, but we didn't think too much about it. That night, we discussed it a bit, just the two of us. I know that it's not ideal, but we must share a place with another person so we can afford the rent, I told my Alice. Yeah, well, I guess you're right, but that guy creeped me out a little, she said. From starting, Will seemed a little odd. He would open his mouth and look at a person talking to him without blinking his eyes. The place is in a great neighborhood. We could move in on our own, but it has to be at the edge of town, I told her. You're right. Anyway, it's not like we'll stay with this guy forever. And from that moment on, we were all set. We packed up the next day, and before we knew it, we were at the new place. The guy wasn't at home, but the landlord gave us a key. The apartment was quite spacious. As we got it, we went straight into our soon-to-be bedroom. After that, we unpacked and managed to create our little private space in there. My girlfriend had two small paintings that she hung on the walls. After that, we went outside our bedroom to explore the rest of the place in detail. But one single door was locked. It was our roommate Will's door. Alice thought that it was a bit odd, but finally we agreed that we'd do the same thing if we were him. Anyway, time passed and we were still alone. We managed to clean up a little, even the living room and the kitchen. The place was beautiful, but didn't really seem all that clean, and me and my girlfriend were sort of clean freaks. It looked spotless, she told me while she was taking off her cleaning gloves. I agreed, and we went into our bedroom to relax. We were cuddling, and, well, you know, we heard the front door open. Alice jumped out of bed, startled, and I followed her shortly. We both got out of the bedroom to say hi to our new roommate, but as soon as he got into the living room, he went into his bedroom. We just saw his bedroom door shut. He didn't even say hello to us. Alice thought he was quite rude. I thought maybe he was a little shy. The night went on as usual, nothing special. We grabbed some snacks, which we had in bed while we watched some romantic comedies on Netflix. The next morning, I got up an entire hour earlier than my girlfriend. The first thing that I did was go into the kitchen and make myself a cup of coffee. As I was trying to find my way there, being really sleepy, I bumped into someone. It was Will. Good morning, I greeted him with a big smile on my face. Will looked at me from head to toe as if he was examining me, and instead of saying good morning, he just said, nice shoes, they look expensive. I paused for a moment, confused. Then I remembered I had left my shoes in the hall last night. Thank you, they were quite expensive. I had to save for a couple of months to afford them, I told him. But his expression didn't change. He was so serious. Well, you better take good care of them. You don't want to lose them, he replied. Alice soon woke up, and I told her about my conversation with Will. She was too sleepy to have an opinion on it, so I changed the subject. The time came for me to go to work. I looked for my phone all over. It was an old iPhone, but I had it for at least four years. I became really quite fond of it. I asked Alice if she saw it, but she said no. We even tried to call it, but it seemed like it was off. As I was running late, I thought I'd look for it when I came back. Anyway, later that evening I came home and Alice wasn't there, but my roommate was. I asked him if he saw my phone. To my surprise, he started acting like I accused him of stealing it. What would I do with your old and slow phone, he yelled. Something didn't seem right. How do you know my phone is old, I asked him. Without even answering, he turned around and went towards the front door, slamming it behind him. I didn't see him for the rest of the night. The next day, it was a Saturday, so me and my girlfriend slept in. We got up around noon, we made some breakfast, and then decided to go for a walk as it was nice outside. Did you see my earrings? Alice asked me. Which ones? The small gold ones? I had them right here on this table, she told me. We started searching for them, but no luck. I thought it was weird. First my old phone and now the earrings. Something wasn't right. 
After staying out all evening, we got back around 8.30 p.m. Being in the mood for some Call of Duty, I went upstairs to start my PS4. But to my surprise, it wasn't there. I went straight to our roommate's bedroom and I tried to open the door. As usual, it was locked. I banged on the door, but he didn't answer. I guess he wasn't there. The next thing I remember was that I told Alice to call the police. They quickly arrived and started searching the building for our roommate. An hour had passed, but he was nowhere to be found. The cops had to call a locksmith to open the door of his room. As we went into his room, I was shocked. Unlike Will, his room was all neat and tidy, like sparkling clean. The police searched his room, but could not find any of our stuff. Before leaving, they told us that they would call back if they found anything. Me and Alice looked at each other with utter sadness. An hour passed and we were still pondering over what to do next. Suddenly, Alice's phone rang. It was the police. They informed us that they had managed to track Will's car. We rushed to the spot and as soon as they opened the door, a lot of stuff started falling out. It was like it was an avalanche. And amongst those things was my PS4, my phone, and Alice's earrings. Will must have stolen from others as well, as there was a lot of stuff on the back seat. He was arrested soon after, and fortunately for us, we got a new roommate. I had many jobs when I was just starting out. I remember when I worked at the local coffee shop, and my manager would be such a jerk. He would always tell me that I moved too slow or that I don't make the coffee the way I should, even though I followed all the steps. No customer ever complained and they all said I make the best coffee in town, but he just had something against me. Another job that was weird was when I worked at a library. I always loved books ever since I was a small girl. And every time I would enter a library as a child, I would feel like I went to Disneyland. I was amazed by the multitude of books surrounding me and all those tall bookshelves were something magical to me. But I'm not here to talk about these jobs. I want to tell you guys about my first job. I was 18, and during my summer break, right after I graduated from high school, I told my mom, Mom, I want to work. I want to make my own money, so I won't have to keep asking you guys. She was so proud. I remember that she hugged me and told me that I could get a job if I wanted to just as long as I remember that any time I needed help from them, financially or otherwise, I should always ask. The next day I woke up early, feeling like a real adult for the first time. I was so proud of myself. I started looking for jobs in my local area, jobs that would fit recent high school graduates and after a couple of hours of looking around, I found something. It was a job that would be perfect for me. I was about to be a babysitter. Well, if they hired me first. I called the number and I told him all about me. The woman who answered seemed very nice, and she asked me if I had time to meet her that afternoon. I said a definite yes. Later in that day, I met with Michelle. That was her name. She was a beautiful woman, a single mom. I was supposed to babysit her daughter, Mia, who was about 10 years old. So she was old enough that the job wouldn't be a hassle. After we had our discussion, she said the following, I really think that you would be a great fit for Mia but this isn't entirely my call. I would love for you to meet her beforehand so she would get comfortable with you. What do you say? Sure, why not? I'd love to meet her. Do you want us to go now, I asked her. Yes, is that a problem for you? It won't take long, and I'll drive you home afterwards. Maybe I'll meet your parents, Michelle told me. I agreed, and the next thing I knew, I was on the passenger seat of her car. The drive wasn't long. She lived fairly close to my home, just a couple of blocks away. Mia, honey, this is your new babysitter, Michelle said after she went through the front door. Hi, mommy, Mia said while hugging Michelle. Mia, sweetheart, Alice will be your babysitter. Come and meet her, Michelle told her. Mia and Mia started talking. She said that she loved dolls and showed me her collection of toys, and we even played a little. It was all going great. After the official meet, she took me home and said that tomorrow morning she will come pick me up. That sounds great. I can't wait, I told her before getting out of the car. I told my parents all about it, and they were so happy for me. The next morning, I got up super early to get ready, and not long after that, Michelle came to pick me up and drop me off at her house. Did you sleep well? She asked me. Well, to be honest, not really. I was so excited about today that I barely got some sleep. 
I replied while smiling at her. After some chit-chat, we were there. I'll be home around 6 p.m., but if something comes up, I'll give you a call, she told me before driving off. I went inside the house and Mia was already awake. She was playing with toys and I decided to join her. Are you hungry? I asked her, but she just moved her head as to tell me that she wasn't. The hours went by and Mia was a real treat to be around. She wasn't naughty, she wasn't rude. She was a quiet kid who loved to play with her dolls. The day went by in a flash and 6 p.m. was right around the corner. I waited for Michelle to come home, but she didn't pull up. She might be running a little late, but she would call, I said to myself. Anyway, another couple of hours passed and still, she didn't even call. I was getting worried. I had her number, so I decided to call her. But as I did, it went straight to voicemail. My parents even called me to see if I'm okay because it was getting really late. I'm fine. I'm here with Mia. Michelle must be running late, I told my mom. Okay, honey. If you need anything, be sure to call us, she told me before ending the conversation. Another couple of hours passed and it got dark outside. Mia was already asleep, tired from playing all day, and I was stuck there, looking out for her. As I was sitting on the couch, watching TV, I heard a noise. It came from the back door. I got up and went to see what was going on. As I was walking, the lights went off in a flash. I got scared, but I didn't want to scream because I didn't want to wake up Mia, who was sleeping in her room. I turned on the flashlight on my phone, and after a couple of more steps, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I turned around and a man grabbed hold of me. He was squeezing so tight that I dropped my phone on the ground. Shut up if you make a single noise. I'll cut you in half, he told me. I started to tear up and nodded my head so that he knew I understood him. He then let go of me, and while he pointed a knife at my throat, he took out a rope from his bag and started to tie me up. He tied me to a chair and put duct tape on my mouth so I wouldn't scream. I watched this house for a long time, and finally she left and hasn't come back before nightfall. They're loaded. Look at this, the guy said as he pointed out all the artwork Michelle had on her walls. I never knew they were valuable. As the guy was taking a painting, Mia came downstairs. What's going on? Why is the light off? She asked. The robber was startled, but then he turned towards Mia. The girl screamed and went upstairs. You didn't tell me there was somebody else in the house, the robber said while coming towards me with his knife. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. The next thing I knew was a solid noise, a thunk. A guy had smacked the intruder with a baseball bat. I was confused, like what's going on here? But then I saw Michelle. She introduced me to her boyfriend and I was so thankful to him for saving my life. Michelle offered to drive me home, which I happily agreed to. Maybe I'm not ready for adulting yet.